Hi, I'm Mike Ram with Shavier Professional. I'm here with Nook Schoenfeld and we're going to be talking about some stuff today. Uh, Nook, how'd you get started in the industry? I was a uh, stagehand in college. I was in college. They had a bulletin board. They said, anybody want to make a little extra money humping gear? I humped gear. One day somebody came in and said, you hump really well. Would you like a job on the road? I said, well, yeah. Can I still hump on the road? They said, you can hump anything that moves, son. I said, okay, I'm in. So I, I finished up my college career pretty soon after that and went on the road. What kind of jobs did you have before you started in the industry? Not much. I was washing dishes. I was a ski bum. I was hanging out. Then uh, my parents convinced me that I really needed to go to college and get a real life. So I went to college when I was 19. Went for an English degree. Learned a lot about literature, hence I became an editor now 30 years later. But somewhere along the way I got lost and ended up on a tour bus and, and just uh, a lot of people showed me how to do a lot of things. I couldn't have done it without people just stopping and giving me their time of day. Um, what was your first design job? Uh, the first actual design job, that's tough. I first went out with, with Night Ranger doing some stuff with Kenny Mednick. This was back in the days when we had uh, one console would run the conventional lights and one would run the moving lights. Right. It was always a dedicated moving lights console. So I had tech very lights and stuff but never run them and then I started working for Morpheus lights and they had invented these things called Panna Spots in the mid 80s and I started running them and then Peter Morris gave me my first LD gig was God, what was her name? Barbara Mandrell, some Nashville singer girl. And I was so green at running a show, but it was great. He designed it all, I ran it all, and then moved on after that. And after three or four tours of programming, production managers liked me and just started calling me to design directly. So in, in 1990, I went freelance and I've never turned back. Uh, your career is like is, is a wide range of acts. You've done so many different acts from the Ramones to Stevie Ray Vaughan and Gloria Stefan to Sting. Um, when you're out doing a show, what influences you to create, um, you know, to create different looks for different songs? How do you differentiate between the acts? You know, I, I don't know how I do it, to be honest. It's, it's weird. I sit down and I think I dream lighting cues. I, what I do whenever I get hired for an act is the first thing I do is I download all their music and I put it in my car and that's all I listen to for weeks till it's like ingrained in my head. It might be a band like Blue Oyster Cult that I freaking hate, but by the end of that two or three weeks I realize that this band made it because somebody likes them and they're doing something right, right. and I enjoy the music. I mean I can even listen to Slipknot on occasion, you know, just because of years of having to work with them. So I, I don't know how I decide. I sit down at the console and it just comes to me. I honestly, I just think, okay, what color should I do this song? And then I don't know. I just, my fingers just start going by themselves. So when you listen to music, do you see color or you just kind Absolutely. Of... I see color, I see peels, I see fly outs, I see dead stop cues, I see ACL bars and, and fan focuses at certain points. I, I can. I can program a whole show without a single light being on, just using my head. Now that's really cool, but like if you ever get design blocked, like sometimes, you know, sometimes you, you hit the proverbial wall. Oh, How do you man. get yourself around that? That's tough. Usually it means you got to go to sleep. <laughs> you wake up and you're fine again. At I, the late night blocks, I remember in the 80s, I did a song, Simply Red, and, and I was blocked on this song for a month. It just looked, this one song, and it was such a great song, but it just looked like dog crap. No matter what I did, I changed around every day. And it was just like, I, I couldn't grasp it. It was like having a block. It was like writer's block, but it was programmer block. And then one day, me and a, a guy, Kelly Lappin, we're sitting in a, in a hotel room and I go, holy shit, I got it. I need to dance the odd ones like this and the even ones like this and just do this. And it'll look phenomenal. Something so basic, easy. And I got on there the next day, programmed it, and it turned out to be the best looking song of the tour. Oh, it just cool. took me, I don't know, 20 shows to write that song. So based on that, so when you're starting to, like a, the design process, where do you start and how do you get through it to the finish? What's, what's your process like? My process is, is, the first thing I try to do is come up with a structure. And I'll do that with paper and pen and I'll just dabble. 
I mean, I, I might be listening to music or, or on Facebook or even watching TV and I'll just draw different things, X's and O's or curves. The other thing I do is, is I, I walk around city streets a lot and I look at architecture. And I take that architecture and I go, oh, that's pretty cool. And I transfer what might be a cool building into a truss layout. I don't know how to explain that in layman's terms, but I get my ideas through that. I get my ideas through looking at other pictures in magazines, not of, of stuff that has anything to do with lighting or theater. Right. You know, it's just like I'll see a cool light at a gas station and go, oh, why isn't there a moving light that does that? Or, right. or how is this halo? This is a great effect. How can I do this on a stage? Your work has a lot of eclectic quality to it. I mean, you've, you innovate so many different ideas. Um, how do you take the, like a smaller act, you know, a, a, a new performer, a new emerging artist, and make that act have a, a much bigger feel to it? Well, it's hard. When, when you have a major act, you have a lot of lights, so you have stuff you can turn on and off a lot. When you have a smaller act, you might say, okay, how do I make this look really cool with just 20 moving lights? And that's what separates the men from the boys in my book. I, I think that a lot of people, given a lot of firepower, can come up with anything. Right. You know, and if you have great media and stuff that's designing it, but what about the guy who always got his video blocks for media? You know, that's free stuff you get off the internet. Or, uh, or whatever lights you have in a club. And you're like, okay, well, maybe you have eight lights that you're going to carry with you. Which eight lights are they going to be? Think seriously about what act you're on. Do you need gobos? No. Do you need LED flash? There's different things. The, uh, big decisions need to be made time-wise between whether to use discharge lights or LED lights. So my, my secret when I'm with a smaller band is to spread the lights out as much as I can, cover as much geographical space on a stage. Right. And sometimes I actually draw plots with just the lights before even the trusses, where I'll just go, oh, what if I had a light here, 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 here? And I'm looking at a front view. I draw everything in 3D. Right. And, and I go, okay, yeah, I like that. I like how that's all coming. A row of lights here and, and three of them here. And then I go, okay, now how do I make this work with truss? How do these, right. you know? And then I'll say, okay, I need curved truss or this. And all right, well, this won't work. I got to move this or... Some days I design stuff, I go to sleep really happy. I think it's, I think it's a freaking great thing. Then the next morning, I wake up, look at it, and it goes right in the bin. It's just, you know, I was tired and I thought it was cool, but it's not cool. So when you're, when you're designing, um, you know, I can speak for myself, I'm, you know, I started out drawing by hand and moved into visualizers. Do you still find yourself doing both where you draw by hand and use visualizers, or do you find yourself using one more than the other? Well, I always use visualizers to program like 90% of my shows now. Uh, uh, yeah, sometimes visualizers can show you that your design sucks just as much as it's good. Right. You know, you, you fall into a trap. I think you wrote about this one time where, you, where you, you think you're doing really good because the visualizer is lying to you. You're, you're seeing something that's not reality where you're like, oh, that looks great. And then when you get to a stage and you go, oh, wait, I only have a 40 foot width of stage. What was I thinking when I drew 60 foot trusses? Right, right. So that's dangerous, but, but visualizers, yeah, no, I can visualize. I've been doing this so long that I'm so set in my program and ways and everything. I know what I'm gonna do. Right. I know what the 10 pre -focus, preset focus positions are and the 20 colors I'm gonna use and all that ahead of time, so. I, I really don't use the previs to, to change my designs. Unless I turn stuff on to make renderings and I go, oh, this looks like ass. I can't use this. And that, that's happened too. It's just like, oh, this looks like Pink Floyd. This, everybody's gonna tell me I'm crazy. So put that in the bin and let's start over. So going from that to the, the visualization process, design process into the actual tour, we go to venues all over the world to do shows. What are some of your favorite venues? My favorite venues are usually the ones that are really hard to get into. Like Red Rocks, it's a nightmare to load in there. But once you're in there, it's heaven. Radio City, not your best place to load in. It's beautiful stage and everything, but you've got that huge ramp to go down with the gear and, and, uh, and, and it's just a tough load in that way. Same thing with the Royal Albert Hall in London. Ah, oh, love playing that place. Once you're inside, it's magic. Your shows are just magic. You get goosebumps. 
But loading in is like the worst morning of your life. What's been your most challenging experience on tour? And how did you overcome it? Most challenging experience was a young man working with Rush and Howard Ungerleiter. We used to load in at six in the morning. I was the master electrician. I had to rig, I had to be there for the rigging call for power. We finished loadouts at four in the morning. Shut the door at four in the morning. Two hours later, we opened it. We worked from Monday through Saturday night and we took Sunday off, that was it. We toured Canada in the winter. They would wait till the middle of August to hit Miami. Why? Because nobody else was going there, so they knew they'd sell the tickets. And that was the hardest I've ever worked in my whole life. Thank you, Howard. Thanks. Yeah. So onwards and upwards, um, how important do you think industry-related education is? Unbelievably important. I, I, I believe there's so much you can do by getting a foot in the door, whether you're taking a few cla theater classes at a junior college, or, or you happen to be fortunate enough to have enough money to go to a full sale university. Any place that can give you an education, get your foot in the ground. The fact that you went to college in the first place or, or tried to further your education past high school means you're a smart guy to me. It means you, 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 you want to learn. Now, not everybody has the money to do that, but I say 50% of the people in our business say, I learned the hard way, you know, earn while you learn. Somebody taught me I learned by washing the snake and putting cam lock connectors on 4 rot and being a grunt. I did the same thing. We all do that. I did it here after college. So, you know, here I am with a degree in English being told I'm worthless and weak and paint that parkan black, fix that cable, come on, move, you know, and just being yelled at. And, but it worked, you know, I became a man. And, you know, continuing education in, in our industry is also really important. What do you think are some of the best, uh, the best resources out there right now for, for once we're in the industry to, to keep the education going? Here's the one thing I swear by. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Every question's good. Y you know, just because you're a lighting guy doesn't mean you shouldn't know how a one-ton motor works. Because one day you're going to be loading in and that thing's not going to work and you got to fix it. Because there's 14 people staring at you and they don't know how it works. So yeah, you gotta fix it. It's no different than, than a dimmer rack patching. I mean, we all learned by getting thrown into the fire. I, I, I was the idiot that kept asking questions until people were like, well, you know it all now. And then they all ask questions to me. And I have time. I, I, whenever, whenever I'm loading in or doing something and I see somebody doing it a little different, I don't tell them they're doing it the wrong way. I just say, I, I'll walk over and I'll, I kind of shame them a little and I go, oh, that's interesting how you're doing it. And they'll look at me with one eye open like, oh yeah, what are you going to do say now? And I'll go, well, I just want to show you what the pros do. And then I'll, I'll you know, and they'll be like, oh, got it, you know, and, and it just, you know, but, but take time. You know, what I, I know a guy, he'll walk up to him, a crew chief, he'll walk up to somebody and go, you're doing that all backwards and then just walk away. So the guy's sitting there going, great, I'm an idiot. I, he's just pointed that out but he's not helping me, right, right. you know? So I, I take time to help everybody out. People took a lot of time to help me out when I was a kid, man. If Michael Keller hadn't taught me how to run one of these, I'd be nothing. If Peter Morse didn't tell me, show me how to light a show or Marilyn Lowy didn't point out how cool it was to light a band with purple from one side and cyan from another, I, I'd have never known these things. But I, I, I sat around and I asked questions long after people went to the bus to relax and sit down. Um, put yourself like in the mentor's position. What kind of advice would you give to an up-and-coming LD that wants to kind of get more on tour or go out and do more, more productions or bigger productions? Network. Offer to do stuff cheap. Offer to do stuff free. I have a guy, Justin, that's been working for me for three years straight. He's on his fifth tour for me. He's great. He knows sometimes I can afford to pay him for certain things, sometimes I can't. But the bottom line is for the last three years, that guy hasn't been home for longer than a week. And it's my fault. I'm sorry, Mrs. Shaw, and uh, if you ever see this, but, but he's worth his weight in gold. And last month I had to, uh, I had a week off where I had to pre a, a show on a grandma for a tour coming up. And it was a tour that Justin was gonna run later on. As soon as he finishes the one gig I have him on, he's jumping to this other tour. So he's going home, he's got 10 days off. He happened to put it on Facebook. And he's like, hey, I'm heading home for 10 days off. 
Yeah, here's your boss looking at that going, right. All right, can you be at my shop on Wednesday? And I just say, huh? Well, yeah, I mean, go home for a week and then come for three days. I'll fly in and, and put you up at a hotel and we'll knock the programming out and you'll be set and you'll be a great place. Now mind you, I'm not paying this guy a dime. I'm like, right. hey, here's some per diem so you can buy some pizza and I'll pay, because the money's coming out of my pocket. But the long run is he looks at himself and he goes, well, wait, you're giving me four months of work. I might as well come for two days on my dime or, 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 or donate two days of my time to, to learn the show now rather than come in cold right. and go for four months. And, and it, it's a payback thing, you know? I keep him employed and he's paying me back by helping me out there. All right, well, listen, thanks a lot for stopping by, Nook. We really appreciate it. It was hey, awesome talking pleasure, to man. you. It's always great to be here at Chauvet. You guys are a happening company. Really impressed with the organization down here, the facility. Mwah. Some of the good stuff. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll talk to you later.